I have a person who is in this room that I've been trying to, I'm not going to say it is, that I've been trying to encourage them to quit drinking sodas, because mm -hmm. sodas are pretty much like liquid Satan. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't consume uh, hardly any sugar, mm -hmm. uh, unless they sneak mm -hmm. it in the mm -hmm. foods. Uh, and I don't eat dairy, and I try not to eat processed mm -hmm. foods. I like eating mm -hmm. foods that have a single name, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. broccoli, mm -hmm. you know, not Doritos, because mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. the same thing. So. Um, Let's take soda. A lot mm. of people just consume a ton, and there's a ton of sugar waters, mm. juices mm. and stuff. Good or bad, I mean, Horrendous. Like horrendous, okay. Horrendous so is the best word. The, the thing is, is that Americans consume 50% of their calories through liquids, mm. okay? So I think that one thing we should do is tax the hell out of it. Tax right. the hell out of liquids. Uh, of, of sugar liquids. Yeah. Right? Uh. So if, you, if you, it costs $97 to buy a bottle of Coke, uh, the consumption will go down pretty quick. Well, and that's where m many of the health care costs mm. are going to people that are consuming. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then, uh, so basically, water, teas. I'm really big on coffee, but it's the timing of your coffee that makes a big difference, mm -hmm. right? Do, uh, wait, when you said first thing you eat in the morning, I was going to ask mm. you, what about coffee? It's a bit well, from what the research shows with MRIs, you can see which areas of the brain lit up when you consume certain foods. I recommend that you eat solid food before you take your first sip of coffee. Okay, yeah, because I know many people that the first thing they do is they drink coffee in the morning, and then they get to the other stuff if they get to it. And if they're too busy, the coffee becomes the way that tides them over. Mm -hmm. And these are the same people that are usually stressed out of their fucking minds. Exactly. Yeah, okay, so going back to soda, mm -hmm. what does it actually do to the body? Well, one of the things it does is changes the uh, alkaline balance in your body. One thing that, for example, one, a very good orthopedic surgeon from the Valley showed is that the more the kids drank soda, the weaker the bones are, mm. okay? Because it contains a lot of phosphates, and if you consume too many phosphates, you actually leak calcium of your tissues. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, I never heard of a guy playing football who broke his patella, right? But nowadays, since the 2000s, kids who break their patella playing American football is uh, an epidemic, and the oh. main factor associated with broken bones in teenagers is actually soda consumption. So besides, and then the, the thing is there's all sorts of artificial sweeteners and additives that we're not even sure if they're healthy. I mean, I would like to see the science behind it, but there's not such a thing as this. Well, one of the things we know is that one of the most common additives in soda is sodium benzoate, and it is the uh, chemical most associated with prostate cancer. Mm. So, uh, if you consume a lot of sodas, you're more likely to get prostate cancer. So that's enough of a reason not to, to drink them for males, you know. Um, so they're quite evil, to be fair. Right, yeah, that's good. Now, by the way, so Tim Ferriss uh, has written about you in his latest book, which is Tools uh, of Titans. And he, um, he basically considers you like the guy. So there's a bunch of pages of stuff uh, which is kind of funny, oh, and he has a quote from you, what you put in your mouth is a stressor, and what you say, what comes out of your mouth is also a stressor. And so, um, yeah, so. It's a very good Thank book, 600 pages, and you got, basically it's the top 30 of his uh, most downloaded uh, podcast. Yeah, so listen to the, the episodes mm -hmm. with Charles. Yeah, really they, they've downloaded already over a million copies of that podcast. So it's the 10th most downloaded podcast of the Tim Ferriss series. Uh, and it, I still get emails every day about that first podcast. I just did another one, and I think I already downloaded 700,000 copies. So it's a very uh, good uh, medium to deliver the information. Totally. Well, if you were to get in a physical fight with Tim, you think you could take him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, someone can tag Tim Ferriss so they can watch whatever, however far. Is that still going? Yeah, yeah. Is it? Okay, good, good. Awesome, awesome. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Just talk really loud if you could so that people can hear it. So what is your drink? You said you take a uh, shake after your workout. What is it? What do you what Well, do you what do you consume post-workout will affect how fast you recover from the workout. But what is in the drink is a function of how lean you are. Right? So if you take your shirt off and you shape it, it's like a melted candle, well, you gotta stick to proteins and some amino acids. And if you're very lean and you have a lot of muscle mass, then it would be a combination of carbohydrates, uh, maybe a, uh, five different types of carbohydrates, like pentacarb from ATP labs, and a protein. But one of the things we see clinically is a lot of people are actually intolerant to whey protein. 
So I prefer to use straight amino acids. Or some people are allergic to dairy uh, from cow, but not from goat. So you could have goat protein. I'm not big on plant proteins because it's about as nutritious as uh, the cardboard box. So um, I prefer to use straight amino acids if I'm not going to use a uh, dairy-based protein. Have you, you ever a had a green shake or anything like that? It's not a green shake. It's literally, you're just taking mixed proteins. It's, it's more of a, a manufactured shake is what you're saying. Correct. I mean, there's also now the technology for beef protein shakes, mm -hmm. and they've actually worked on a taste, and they're very good. And like uh, be, yeah, like that's, that's what JJ Virgin's latest shakes are, is it's organic beef protein. Yeah. Shaking a steak. Oh. <laughs> Basically, it's a steak shake. The steak shake. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Jennifer, and then we'll go to Paris. So, when it comes to even some of your like the athletes that you work with, I'll in, um, I'll show the, I'll show the Facebook live through the beautiful okay. uh, audience. Uh, um, you talked a lot about like the yin and some of the mindset, and so how have you been able to? get to people to be more consistent with their workouts and some of these things as far as like stopping drinking pot when for the most part it's probably like an emotional thing <coughs> for them that's stopping them from working out or an emotional thing, a trigger that gets them to drink that pot. I don't give much credence to that because if people don't control their food intake, then it's easier for them to make bad choices. So the emotional part somewhat, but I think that a lot of it is solvable by managing your brain nutrition to a T, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a lot of ADD is malnutrition, right? So you fix the kid's diet that suddenly you can concentrate. As are is it addiction. Yeah, yeah, and addictions and so on. So I think that if you, uh, there's a lot of uh, papers that have been published mainly out of Toronto and Boston where they look at the composition of the breakfast and how it impacts uh, uh, um, cognition, but also uh, food choices throughout the whole day. So it does really set you up uh, f uh, as far as uh, discipline if you eat, have a proper breakfast. Yeah, I think that you know one of the best ways to solve all of America's health issues would be to have a federal breakfast program, right? And then you don't have to feed your kids at home. You bring them in half an hour earlier, and they have the right nutrition. Right? So if I was emperor of all galaxies, I would standardize the breakfast because that would be a way to fight things like obesity and uh, you know, kids don't pay attention in, in class. And, and any, ask any school teacher, you can tell if kids eat breakfast and a proper breakfast by the attention span in class, okay? Because it sets you up for the whole day. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And we'll go to, we'll go to Paris. I want to clarify, uh, you know, the point on the post-workout shake. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, you have a shake with grape juice in it, and it uh, causes you to get insulin, which builds muscle. Am I to understand that you're not a proponent of that? I'm a proponent of it if you deserve it. Write this down. You need to deserve your carbohydrates, okay? So if you're not lean, like, uh, you know, tell a man, if you don't have penis skin on your arms, you're too fat. Okay, so you pinch, it has to be really lean. If it's not, fuck, stay away from carbohydrates. <laughs> They're not your friend, right? No. But I, I think that's really good to be vulgar because it raises dopamine levels sure. and people will actually pay attention, right? <laughs> so, but, the, yeah, but the thing is, is that we, I'm for spiking some post-workout if you deserve it, okay? So you have to be sub 10% body fat for a male and sub 16 for a female. Cool. All right, so if you could say it real loud, Ed, too. Sure. Uh, I wonder if, Charles, if you could talk about the difference, especially on a guy's hormones, with respect to doing isolated workouts versus compound workouts. You know, full body movements versus isolation. Is there a difference? Yeah, what if you look at the research, the, the larger, larger the muscle, muscle mass you recruit, the more hormones, I mean, beneficial hormones you produce. So if all your exercise or single joint, you're not gonna build a lot of muscle mass, you're not gonna lose a lot of fat. So if you center your first 70% of your workout around big compound exercise, you're on the right way. Uh, I have a friend who's uh, set 76 world records in powerlifting. He says, work on the Christmas tree, not the ornaments, right? <laughs> so uh, that's Ed Cohn. So I think it's really important that you uh, 
what, it's what I call most bang for your buck exercises. So squats, deadlifts, chin-ups, bench presses. I really like a lot of dumbbell work uh, because it keeps you balanced and I really like fat handle uh, type of dumbbells. Joe has done a video on that. Yeah, Watson's gym in the UK. Yeah. Make the best dumbbells in the world. For sure. Designed by Charles. Yes. So, uh, you know, nothing beats the basics. And the thing is, is that basics are hard work and people like to avoid hard work, right? I mean, they do tricep kickbacks and they don't forget to purge the lips. Okay? <laughs> well, that's not gonna do much for you, right? But if you vomit a lung because you did a set of 20 in a squat, you're gonna make progress, right? It's real great advice, just yeah. Th yeah. The good workout is that your spleen should come out through the left eye. Yeah. If it does come out through, not the right eye, but the left eye, then the workout was hard enough. <laughs> So we'll take two more. So summer and then Dan and then we're done. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Yeah, thoughts on intermittent fasting for people watching the Okay. If you look at the research, you'll find that intermittent fasting is beneficial and very obese. But what a lot of the research on intermittent fasting is look at the world through a straw. Okay, they don't look at other things. But in the labs where they look at things like cognition, they found, and muscle performance, they found that intermittent fasting was harmful. So I think that you should take care of your brain, right? So I'm not big on intermittent fasting. There's different conditions. Where it depends how you do it. There's a lot of, but one thing they found in women is that it does really mess up the endocrine system. And one of the things I find when people who do intermittent fasting, they become food obsessed, okay? It's like, oh, I don't know, another 52 minutes, another 48, right? And then they compensate by drinking more coffee. So um, I think that because I'm a big believer in a breakfast, I'm not so keen on intermittent fasting. I, some people are very, but I think a lot of it with intermittent fasting, if it works for you or not, is actually genetics. Some people, for example, if I did intermittent fasting, I would be for the first time in my life on CNN because I've killed 76 persons in a parking lot, okay? <laughs> on my way to work because I get extremely irritable if I don't manage my protein intake in the morning. Some people don't have an appetite at all. So I'm not 100% against intermittent fasting. It's conditional, but I'm not a big fan of it either. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. Okay, Dan? So uh, you brought up breakfast being the most important, mm. I guess, meal of the day. I have an 11 and 9 year old, you know, they're important to me. And also for me, I'm curious, what are the foods that you recommend at breakfast that, you know, the, the best that we could look at, either for ourselves or our kids? I think what you have to look at is a very high quality protein. Now, I prefer to eat only wild meat, so. You know, I live in Colorado, so I can get elk or yak or, or bison. And awesome dribble. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's if you live in Kentucky. But it, the, the quality of the protein is very important. So, and then I would like to have a type of nut. The reason why I like to have different types of nuts for breakfast is that they provide choline, which is a precursor to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So it helps you with paying attention and brain speed, which is important in our lives. And then, if you can afford it, berries is a good source of a carbohydrate. A very simple rule is the thinner the skin is of the, of the fruit naturally, the more phytonutrients it has. Because for example, a raspberry doesn't want to be sunburned. So uh, how do you protect yourself from the sun, which is an oxidant, you make antioxidants. So if you look at, for example, uh, grapes, the grapes that are, have the highest amount of uh, phytonutrients are the ones harvested in hills, like in Sardinia and in Spain, as compared to, let's say, German wines, which are in valleys and they don't have that uh, angle of the sun. So berries are a very good choice. Uh, and any thin peel fruit is good. Uh, do you advocate green shakes? Green shakes are very good. One of the problems, though, in the industry is a lot of them are loaded with heavy metals. So there's some companies that are good and some, you know, might as well drink a liquefied bumper, okay? So <laughs> uh, the quality of the product really matters. Like if you made 
yourself, like spinach. Okay, that's even better. Protein. If you make your own green drinks, but I, I thought you were asking about powdered greens. Powdered greens are, are there's a lot of very good cutteries out there, but usually if you can buy them into a regular store, you're drinking a green liquefied bumper because it's full of heavy metals. Mm. Okay. What about juicing versus like blending like greens mm. uh, in smoothies? The problem with juicing is that you cut away the fiber. And a fiber is very important to stabilize your blood sugar. So I prefer to use a powdered green versus a uh, juicing. Okay, cool. Anything that I should have asked you that I did not that you would like to say? Well, I'll take an extra question on that. I don't know. I mean, there's so many things we could talk about. Is this the most important book you've ever read? The pre-release uh, of, course. of, I, um, you, of Joe's marketing book? But your check didn't clear my bank account. <laughs> 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 Until it does. <laughs> no, but this is a very good book. Uh, I've actually read it. Or that one of the first advanced copies. And we do marketing every day anyway, right? So it, it is a valuable tool. Yeah, I just needed to fit that in just okay. for no other reason than it's, you're right here. And, yeah. like, and my self-esteem requires yeah. constant edification. Mm. Um, Okay, so where do people find more information about you? On my website, which is strengthsensei.com. So strength and S-E-N-S-E-I. Yep, strengthsensei.com. And uh, what I'm gonna do in the future because of what we're doing with Artists for Addicts and the platform with addiction, Charles can speak to a variety of different uh, subjects on health and exercise and fitness and supplementation, but he also knows a ton about the brain and about human behavior. And so I want to do a whole episode with you in the future when we launch the platform to help people with addictions about, because like for instance, uh, the supplements, if someone has an alcohol problem and they want their body to kind of reject alcohol, mm -hmm. what is it? The best two are the combination of two amino acids, which is thy tyrosine and dl phenylalanine. And if you take three grams of each on an empty stomach in the morning, people will find that they don't find alcohol tasty anymore. Mm -hmm. So they naturally uh, take it out of their regimen. Um, you will find that pretty much anything that has to do with the brain is fixable with a certain combination of the omega-3s and certain amino acids. Mm -hmm. okay. Because with fish oil, if the fish is big and comes from a warm water, it tends to contain more EPA. And of the omega-3s, EPA down-regulates inflammation. So if you have arthritis, high blood pressure, and so on, you want to use a fish oil with a lot of EPA. But if you have attention deficit disorder or bipolar disorder, there's at least 16 brain disorders that we know are uh, manageable with the right type of fish oil. But that fish oil has to have a high DHA content. And where do you get a high DHA content in the fish oil? They're telling it to be small fish in very cold water, like sardines and herrings and so on. But when you go to the store, if you go to your doctor or your nutritionist, you could look at the ratio between EPA and DHA, and that will decide actually which tissues are affected with it. If you don't have anything particularly with your health, I would say every time you go through a ball of fish oil, pick another brand with a different ratio, and that will uh, lower the odds that uh, you have any sort of disorder. One thing you should know about uh, omega-3s, is that there's not a single disease known to man, and I've known this since 1994, that is not helped by omega-3s. Mm -hmm. So if you don't believe me, you could go to PubMed, which is uh, the biggest uh, library of scientific papers, and put in any weird disease you know, and put omega-3 as a second keyword, and you will find at least one study, if not men of 14, that show that that fish oil is beneficial for um, any ailment known to man. Is there any way to know if fish oil is good? I've heard that a lot of the fish oil you buy in stores is rancid and you should just never eat it. It's actually worse than not eating it. I used to do it until I, I heard that. And, you know, you hear so much bullshit advice. You know, worst advice is, you know, bad advice is the worst thing you can take. So how do you know whether fish oil is good or bad? The best way to find out is it available through a uh, health practitioner only. So basically it means that you can't buy it on the internet. The only company, the, I, there's an exception to the rule, and I don't get paid by this company, it's called Nordic Naturals, okay? Nordic. And they have very high quality, they really uh, standardize the way they make uh, fish oil. But, uh, and in Canada, the rules are very different. So in Canada, you can actually buy a store-bought fish oil, and probably the best company to buy is called uh, ATP Labs. But they make a fish oil that already has carnitine in it, it's called Omega Carn, and I think that's the best product for your brain. Uh, one thing we know from research is that any brain disorder is actually elec an electri electrical problem in your brain. And research backs up the combination of carnitines 
and omega-3 is, is probably the best healing agent for any brain disorder, from ranging from dyspraxia to dyslexia. And you're saying six grams per day? That would be a minimum. I mean, it depends on your percentage of body fat, right? Uh, so at higher body fats, I've used as much as 45 grams, but that means your body fat's 45%. As you get leaner, you will use less and less fish oil, okay? So it's relative, if you got 10%, do 10. Yeah, it, typically, when you start off, but you could be at 10%, You've been on fish oil for six months. If I measure your fatty acids in your blood, it may be down to three grams. But usually, um, one of the guys, if I was recommending 30 to 45 grams for at least uh, two decades, and then I remember Mark Houston is probably one of the best vascular health specialists in the world, said, so man, that's a three to f eight times more what the literature recommends. But the problem, the literature never tried eye dosages. And one of the best compliments I ever had is that in 2008, there was a Canadian study that showed that in, in the average person, 60 grams of fish oil was the best dose, okay? So he sent me an email, he says... In the bottle of the day, huh? No, but if you use liquid, it's not so f uh, bad. But the thing, the, the interesting point that Mark put in his email was clinicians always ahead of the research, okay? But when we were cavemen or cave women, we consumed three to 400 grams of omega-3s a, a week but where would they come from? It came from animal brains. Because if you're in, a, in South Africa, you're not in the middle of the savanna, you're not going to have access to a lot of fish. So what would happen is that the caveman would wait for the lion. The lions eat the entrails of the antelope and leave the rest alone. So what the caveman would do is he would split the skull of the antelope and eat the brain. And 60% of the brain is actually omega-3s and 80% of that is DHA. So that's why what you find in research is that where humans, early humans, consume the most omega-3s, the faster their brains developed. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's a strong correlation between omega-3 content in a native diet and IQs. Okay, so for example, uh, the bow and arrow concept was developed where there was more uh, better developed brains. Okay. We're going to talk about kids. In the you know, I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come to kids because people may not realize how children are truly being poisoned yeah. with foods that are actually marketed as healthy and nutritious. And it's, it's, it's really screwed up because not only, see, children don't have the, the mental ability to really even determine long-term consequences of what that's going to lead to later in life. Well, and they also generally don't have a car or a bank account, so someone's giving them this stuff. They're not yeah. going grocery shopping. They might get in the cart and, and you know, then bug their mommy for the sugar-coated cereals. But it's, again, it's not the ones you just point out really uh, well, that it's not the foods that we think are bad that are creating the problems. It's the foods we actually think are healthy. Right. And one of the things that drives me insane is the fact that we can put no sugar added on a label. Now, I'm going to show you one. I brought, I have, I have things. You've got, you've got I've props I've got here. things. So, but I just want to show you. So this says no sugar added on this mm -hmm. label. Yep. Okay, so if you look at the ingredients on this thing, it says no sugar added, yet it's, and this is called green machine, right? Mm -hmm. Boosted green machine. No sugar added, yet it's got apple juice, mango puree if you look at kiwi yeah, pineapple, all of those banana puree right. and these are and these are all the fruits in the sugars in the beginning and then you get to spirulina natural flavors alfalfa broccoli spinach barley but those are at such so lower levels they did a little bit of green to give it color so they could call a green machine but in reality they and they put purees of fruit juice in there mm. so fruit juice concentrate fruit juice purees you can put these things into p products and say no sugar added. So those little, those little dried fruit snacks that they do, like check this one out. This, I mean, does this not look, it's organic made in nature. I'm not sure where else you'd make cranberries, yeah. <laughs> like in a lab, like <laughs> right. where would you make them? But they're, they say no gluten and no nuts and no sugar added, no sugar added. Now I'm right. not sure how you could have gluteny cranberries but you know it's such a good marketing thing now we'll put no gluten I'm sure yeah, you put you put no gluten you can on put stuff. it on a potato no gluten right. uh, remember when they did that with cholesterol they'd have a potato with no cholesterol I'm like right. it doesn't have a liver never had one but <laughs> um, no sugar added it's got apple juice concentrate yeah so let's talk about apple juice apple juice I'm gonna go on a total rant here because this this is a kid's drug of choice kids drug of choice is this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk Oreos in a minute because Oreos are crazy, but let's say this is a kid's drug of choice. Right. This is worse than this. 
Then it, this is worse than this. Hmm. You're going to say, why, JJ? Why would that be? Well, if people are listening to the audio version of this, there's a can of, uh, there's a can of apple can juice. A can of apple juice, and, then, and uh, there's a Coke. Yeah. Now, how could it, oh, that was a Diet Coke. But let's pretend for, let's pretend, let's suspend disbelief here in, in uh, TV land and say that was a Coke. So a, an apple juice is worse than a Coke because it's higher in fructose. So again, you've got kids with fatty livers. We've got kids right now, um, the obesity rate in children, one in three kids is either overweight or obese. Do you remember when we were growing up that it was like there was one fat kid in class and it was the weird, it was like the rarity and they teased them and they weren't even obese, they were overweight. Right, right. Now we've got one in three being overweight or obese. Oh, it's, it's dramatic. I mean, the way it just, it breaks my heart. This is like, the last couple decades. yeah, that, that whole evolution thing has gotten way worse than anyone ever would have projected that evolution picture. But um, we've got this quadrupling now in teens. Like obesity is now quadrupling over the last, thir from 30 years ago to now, obesity has quadrupled in teens, doubled in kids. This should not be happening. The fact that we've had to change the name of adult onset diabetes to type two diabetes because children are getting it should be sign enough. But what we're doing is when you look at it, exposure equals preference. We are creating drug addicts with our kids and realize that if you are an overweight or an obese child, the chance you'll be an overweight or obese adult is 70%. Now, a lot of that is, okay, we've exposure equals preference and realize that, again, the kids aren't getting in their car and driving to the store, so how are the Oreos getting in the house, right? right? right. I mean, we don't have the stuff in the house, so I will tell you a funny story. I get these Oreos because I, and I'm gonna tell you the, the drug story about the Oreo in a minute, but I get these Oreos and I bring them to my studio house because we're gonna take, tape this whole kitchen makeover where we throw the bad stuff out and we bring the good stuff in. So I get the low fat Oreos and I get the double <laughs> stuff Oreos, which in reality, the low fat Oreos are worse than the regular Oreos because when you take fat out, you bring more sugar in. Uh -huh. I mean, that is one of the biggest problems that's happened over the last 20 years is that we decided that fat was the villain because of Ansel Keys, who really took down our health nationwide. We pulled the fat out, we put sugar in its place because high fructose corn syrup is so cheap and just devastated the health of the nation. Um, but so I have these Oreo cookies and Bryce, my 17 year old, comes into this studio house. He's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like he has walked into, you know, heaven. He's like, what is all this stuff? I mean, because there's, there's sodas and cupcakes and all just trash. He's like, thinks mommy has finally like lost her mind. That's funny. And he's like, can I have some of those? I go, they're props, Bryce, they're props. You know, he goes, please, pretty, please, pretty, please. He wants these Oreos. Right. Like he's going straight to the Oreos. Apparently this is the number one cookie, Oreos amazing with this thing inside that who even knows what this white stuff is anyway he eats two of these oreos because i just it's, I'm it's like, like okay i'm putty. gonna watch i'm gonna watch what happens here um eats two of them and i'm looking over him he says i can't eat anymore he goes i feel sick yeah score score <laughs> one for the home team so they did this study of uh rats at connecticut college and what they found in the study, they compared morphine to Oreos, and what they found was that morphine and Oreos both have the same effect on the brain. Hmm. They both light up the reward center of the brain, they trigger endorphins and dopamine and serotonin. But given the choice between the morphine and the Oreos, the rats chose the Oreos. Interesting. That is interesting. Frightening. I mean, just scary stuff. So, I mean, think about that when you're giving your kid apple juice and Oreos. Yeah, you know, I was actually talking to someone earlier today about addiction uh, and about drugs because, you know, as I've talked about publicly, I was a, a really bad drug addict when I was 18 years old. I would freebase cocaine and I literally would uh, wake up to get high and I would get high to go to, to, go to bed. I mean, I literally was just that was my coping mechanism. It, you know, I wanted to get rid of the pain, the anxiety, the stuff I was experiencing, the boredom. I just chose a really bad way of doing it. And we were having this conversation. It was with a dentist. And it, it was funny because I said, well, you know, um, they found out in the 50s that if they hit the dopamine serotonin centers of a rat with, you know, drugs, the rat will push the pellets uh, and, and, you know, keep hitting it to get the high over sleep, over food, over sex, over, uh, you know, everything. 
And a rat doesn't have the ability to make a, a moral judgment. I mean, they don't sit and think, well, what I'm doing is right or wrong. They just want that hit. And so what's going on in the brain is biochemical. Mm -hmm. And so people that are, you know, really beat themselves up or other people that beat up addicts, uh, it hijacks the brain, and yeah. food hijacks the it brain. It hijacks the and brain, and then they sneak it in everywhere. So you don't even realize you're doing it. You think, I'm having that green drink, I'm doing a great thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm having, oh, I'm supposed to start today with this skim milk and cereal. And so you don't realize, so your brain, you're addicted to this. Mm -hmm. Now you have to eat every two to three hours because you've got the brain issues put together with your biochemistry because now your blood sugar is going up, your insulin's up, your insulin's high, you can't access stored fat for fuel, so your blood sugar crashes, you have to eat again. And all of a sudden you can't even use stored fat for fuel, you're a sugar burner, and you're addicted to the sugar, and your biochemistry is starting to shift, you're becoming insulin resistant. Right now in the United States, we have 86 million people who are insulin resistant, pre-diabetic. 86 million, 29 million people are diabetic. And of those 29 million people, 8 million don't even know they are. And a sweet drink, if you drink one or two sweet drinks a day, so that could be that green drink, that could be this. That could be this vitamin water that you're having for focus that has 31 grams of sugar. So let's talk about this. I mean, I think... Uh, <laughs> oh, this one's lower. This one, no, it's 31 grams of sugar. So it's vitamin water. Sugar. It's called vitamin water. That sounds very healthy. Is, is that healthy? It's vitamin water focus by the way, this is for focus because actually, and it's naturally sweetened. It's naturally sweetened. I just want people to understand how duped we are by marketing. I mean, shame on them for doing this. And this is why I'm taking this on. I'm gonna need a lot of help. Because mm -hmm. as you can yeah. imagine, I'm taking on all of, these, all of these companies with all this marketing that are taking our health down. Yeah. And I mean, we have an economic crisis. Our economic crisis is because of these things. This is what's happening. It drives me crazy because if you drink one of these every day, you are going to increase your risk of diabetes by 25%. Interesting. And you thought by drinking this or that green drink that you were doing a good thing for yourself. Well, and it see, makes it even worse. Yeah, see, that's the whole thing. It's one thing to know, oh, I'm just drinking a milkshake or I'm drinking, but there's or, a or, lot or of... Or what about Insure Active? That's the muscle health one. Mm. So talk about that. Okay, so what? so I actually and this okay. that was my question is now, what are these liquids now, that people Now here's what's so ridiculous. You can't even even with my glasses on I wouldn't be able to see this. So so in <laughs> order to so big, I have this huge this big I, like. <laughs> <laughs> But can, if you look at it so can, Guys real quick just for the camera. Okay, <laughs> because you can't see this. But look at here's this thing. It's 200 calories, 250 calories for this little bottle, mm -hmm. and there are 22 grams of sugar in it. And the first ingredient's water, but the second ingredient is sugar, and then there's corn, which is basically, corn maltodextrin, which is also sugar, okay? So it's got sugar and sugar, and then it's got some soy protein just to lower your thyroid along with it. So we'll raise your insulin and lower your thyroid. Bam, bam! That is a <laughs> muscle-building liquid. And that's muscle health. Yeah. How on earth can, but, just, but just goodness, ensure Just active. goodness in a bottle, isn't it, all this stuff? <laughs> It just makes me, it makes me crazy. Yeah. It just makes me no, crazy. No, no, and, and it should. I mean, it's bullshit. I mean, well, but here's really the deal. Is. It's I have, I have so many, this, I mean, we talk about sugar as a drug, and people are like, I'm not eating that much sugar. I'm not eating that much sugar. We're not eating this anymore. I mean, our table sugar consumption, thankfully, has gone down, mm -hmm. but we are getting 22 teaspoons of sugar in a day, and kids are getting in 34 teaspoons a day. Can you, because uh, when you talk about grams, like 22 grams or 18 grams or 30 grams or whatever in, in a bottle, uh, can you explain what that is? Like, I think in the in a soda, um, like a Coke or Pepsi, there's something like 11, is it 11 so tablespoons or teaspoons? So a 16 ounce of? soda has 44 grams, which is about 140 calories of sugar. Uh -huh. I mean, just, it's a little heap of sugar. What I like to look at it, how I did this for a great visual for people, because I think, you know, no one's going to get up and have an ice cream cone for breakfast, I, I, I would hope. Right. But if you got up and had your cereal with your skim milk, a glass of orange juice, maybe put some sliced bananas on that cereal, because that's got good potassium, right? Right. That's basically about four ice cream cones worth of sugar. Four ice cream cones worth of sugar. A bowl right. of cereal, skim milk, a banana. Right. And what else? And some orange juice. Okay. You know, so the calcium fortified orange juice. Let's right. make it even better. Or let's say you were just going to go get a skinny latte and a muffin. Uh -huh. A skinny latte and a muffin is three ice cream cones. Now, that muffin, in reality, if you wipe the frosting off a cupcake, take a look at it. What is it? 
It's a muffin, right? Mm -hmm. So a muffin is just a cupcake without the frosting on it. But it, all of a sudden you called it a muffin, and right. what if it's a whole grain muffin? And you just, now you have a little halo, and I think that's where the biggest damage is coming from, is all these things that are agave sweetened, or there's no sweetener added. You know, a low fat little strawberry yogurt, 26 grams of sugar. That's nearly two ice cream cones worth of sugar. And again, these are things that we're doing to be healthy. That's why we've got this crisis. We've got a crisis of misinformation where we are being duped. It's creating this addictive cycle with all of us and then destroying our biochemistry along with it. So all of a sudden we're going, I cannot, why am I pre-diabetic? You know, right. I just had someone come to me and she was using a health shake every day. She can't figure out why she can't lose weight. I go, you know, it's probably just a couple simple tweaks. I usually just can catch a couple little things. And she every day had been given this, this shake that was supposed to help control blood sugar. It had 17 grams of fructose in it. Hmm. This is where you get into trouble. Right? Well, totally, totally. <laughs> so here's what, here's what I like to do just because I'm sitting there thinking to myself, all right, if someone this is like new to them. They've never heard this before. And I know a lot of people that, you know, I, I interview lots of health experts and stuff. Uh, you know, they're familiar with it, but they may not have, you know, gone this deep with it or, or have heard this perspective as it, as it relates to sugar. And some people are like, you know, I mean, you're talking about stuff that I eat every day. I love the way this tastes and I don't want to trade that for, you know, because the brain mm -hmm. is still right, hooked. Right, right, I mean, yes, you know, see and the, we don't like change either. Oh, absolutely so. not, and when, you, when, you're, when you're addicted, and I think a ton of food stuff it is addictive. It's I mean, built it, to be addictive, totally. that way we sell more of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, look, you, you look at, at, at the McDonald's playgrounds, I mean, they don't just want the people hooked on the food, they want them hooked on the environment, they want them hooked on the right. Happy Meal, the toys. Well, we put gluten so, on the french fries. Yeah. There's gluten on the french fries. In yeah, and I think even, God, 20 years ago, the Chicken McNuggets, they were injected with six different uh, sort of liquids, one including real high sodium and all, to, to give flavor. Yeah, usually we've got a sugar, salt, fat combo that, that, like, if you look at a lot of the sodas, it's sugar and salt because then you want more and more and more. Right. You know, so there's reasoning behind all of this stuff, and it's so that you'll want more, more, and more. But here's the thing, and I, I, I kind of get where you're going with this, and... The deal is it's simpler than people realize. What I wanted to do was make this, if it's not easy to do, and if, it's, if they're hard to find foods or it's expensive or it doesn't taste good, no one's gonna do it. Right. What I hear from people over and over again is they actually like the swaps better because it's really just trading habits. You're used to eating one thing, you're just gonna shift it out for something else. In the first couple days you might be going, all right, where's the, you know, I'm missing the skin, skinny latte, but instead you're having um, either your bulletproof coffee Shout out to Dave. Dave Asprey. Um, we love Dave coffee. Asprey. Cool so guy. either you're having that and you will never miss that skinny latte again, or you're having some coconut milk and an espresso. It's not hard to do. It's just knowing which things to make the shifts from. But the bigger thing that I've heard is that within two weeks and really during, so I have people, I'll kind of back up. I have people first test mm -hmm. just by doing that simple um, sugar impact quiz and doing what I call the sneaky sugar inventory where I go through the most common medium and high sugar impact foods. We talked about some of them, pickle relish and balsamic vinegar and these no sugar added jams. We go through all that just so you can get a feel for how much you're eating in a typical week. Right. Because it's an eye opener even for the most healthy eater. And if it is, what I tell people similar to the virgin diet is that's awesome. Because if you were absolutely flawless and still feeling like crap, you know, then we got to go look for some real deep, deep lying health issues. If you see that these things have been sneaking in, how awesome is that? Because in two weeks, you can be in a totally different place. Now, what I think makes this different in a, from everything else is when I looked at these programs, I went, wow, they have you go cold turkey. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work with someone who's now trained their body to be a sugar burner because the minute you pull these foods out, your energy is going to crash and that's going to send you searching for a cookie. So the first week I have you just learn to live by the sugar impact plate, which means eat clean lean protein and healthy fats and some low impact carbs to give a nice steady supply of energy to the brain. Do that, but taper from high sugar impact to medium sugar impact. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go low right away. You're just going to start creating that awareness. And then you take two weeks and you go low. And it is the most exciting thing because this is where you make this transition from being a sugar burner where you have to eat every two hours and your whole life is about food to being able to go four to six hours. In fact, Jeff Moore told me that he said, JJ, I don't even, I have to remind myself to eat. 
this was a food addict guy who dieted as a hobby for his whole life. I mean, he's probably lost a couple thousand pounds in his life, and he has to remind himself to eat again. But the bigger thing that happens during that time, because we drop fructose down to almost zero, is you reclaim your sweet sensitivity, and at the end of that time period where we go back and we start to match you up and go, okay, let's try some higher sugar impact foods, they taste too sweet. You recognize how bad they make you feel, right. but they taste too sweet. You don't want them anymore. And it sounds incredible to say that. I'm sure if you're listening, you're like going, yeah, that sounds crazy. Yeah. But again, I took these diehard sugar addicts. I didn't do this the easy way when I tested it on 700 people. I basically went out and went, all right, who, if, you, if this is your problem, if you feel like you cannot quit sugar, it's taking you down, you're the one I want. Yeah. Well, see, and, and see, that's one of the reasons why I, I really am happy that we're doing this interview because I've referred a lot of people to your work, to your books. Uh, Jeff Moore, you know, I, I introduced you to Jeff Moore. And, and, and the cool thing about him is this is a guy that, that runs a multi million dollar food company. I mean, he sells, you know, wild things seafood. I mean, he sells seafood, he sells meat, you know, grass fed, all kinds of stuff. And this is a guy who you would think like has access to all kinds, I mean he, he has all the food he, he could want, healthy or whatever, and he's lost at this point, and this is a few months ago, yeah. you know, four, over like, 40 pounds. But and I think the funniest thing of all, and it just, it, it's, it shows what a problem this is, is here was Jeff, he said, I've got your book, I just don't know, you know, what will I eat? I go, what do you sell? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you sell wild fish? So he sent me a picture and I talked about this actually in my public television show. This just shows how far you can go. He sends me this picture of this sea of cheesecakes. He is at this event and there is a sea of cheesecakes. Sea every of flavor. Surfing. The cheesecakes. Surfing. Oh my God. I mean, every flavor. They're beautiful with cookies in them, like just cheesecake. <laughs> and I'm looking at this and he sent me this picture and I'm thinking, uh oh. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh oh. <laughs> like, this is going to be, this is going to be his takedown shot. And he sends me this. He goes, I don't feel anything. I'm sitting here in the sea of cheesecakes and I have no cravings, no desire, no not. I mean, this is a sugar addict. Right. Right? right. And, and that just shows you that you can get there and it just, it's like, just say, hey, I've got two weeks. I mean, it, what if in two weeks you could break that control that sugar has had on you for your whole life? Because for all of us, I mean, if you look at it, I don't have a sweet tooth, but I was raised because some people genetically do. I was raised on Pop-Tarts, Captain French, and Cocoa Puffs. And when I thought I was doing better, I switched to frozen yogurt and black licorice. I just kept shifting my vices, thinking I was doing better, until finally I went, this is not, this is not working. Right. It hasn't fixed the problem because I'm still getting sugar. It just is in a different wrapper. Can I mention something? It, this is bringing this up for me because you mentioned you know, replacing habits. And I, uh, I, I'm really not a big fan of discipline. Um, you know, I think it's a guilt uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, obviously, it's a, a contextual thing. Uh, but, you know, if someone says, well, I got really bad habits. You know, I just have a bad habit that I do this, I do that. And I think people that are really out of shape, people that really just their health is shot. I mean, they're just not in great shape. They have a lot of really good habits that got them there. I mean, if you wake up every morning and you guzzle, uh, you know, um, a couple of c a cups of coffee filled with sugar and cream, and you smoke a cigarette and you yell at your wife and you kick the dog. I mean, you just have really good habits of waking up, doing, you know, eating a donut. I mean, those are really, you, so it, you can replace these, mm -hmm. the, these, these habits completely. And there's a friend that I had recommended to read this really great book that was written by a friend of mine named Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. Just love that mm -hmm. book. And I, I interviewed, I've got you know, it. Stephen 10 years ago when he first wrote that book. And, um, you know, it's just a great book and I recommend it to, you know, um, it's, it's about resistance, and I'd ask this person, "Did you read War of Art yet?" And they're like, "Oh no, I haven't got around to it. I've been real busy." And I said, "I just said this. This is a couple weeks ago." I said, "Do me a favor. It's a short book. Just don't go on Facebook for two weeks. Just you could read it in an hour." Yeah, yeah. I, I said, "I go <laughs> just don't go on Facebook for two weeks. The time you would typically I know this is going to be really hard because you're like a Facebook addict, but just try not." To. I just said that, like kind of even joking. Four days later. She calls me, she's like, that book was awesome, thank you. And that whole thing about just not going on Facebook and using that time, I still went on Facebook, but the, I did, I read the book. 
And so when you're talking about the two week period, if people are like, I don't have the time, I mean, you know what? You, there are things you are doing, be it watching television or doing this or doing that. Read JJ's book. Take the, the I mean, so the whole thing, we're identifying a lot of the problem, but see, the, the great thing is you, you don't, you're not the person well, that just identifies the problem. You actually have, here's what to do, here's how to do it, and you make it very simple. Here's so. the thing. I mean, the biggest objections people will ever have are time and money. Mm -hmm. Really, I think that what's really holding them back is not time or money. I think it's that they've failed so many times before, they've tried so hard, they've just given up. I think that's the bigger issue with it. Because in reality, it actually costs less to eat this way. Mm -hmm. And I, I've proven that now. I've gone to the grocery store, I've done it. I know that it costs more to eat the unhealthy way. It, it definitely costs more financially, physically, emotionally to do it. But time-wise, you can open up the book and go to the blueprints, take five minutes to study it, and then make the switches. It's maybe an hour to really do it. Because once you get used to the shifts, it's normal food that you can eat anywhere. So that part of it's a non-issue too. It's really more about looking at this and going, well, what if she's right? And what could that mean to me? What's holding me back right now? Because I look at it and you know my story. You know, we never know when something is gonna, either an amazing opportunity is gonna hit or a major crisis that you have to be all in is gonna hit. And when my son got hit by the car and left for dead in the street, and I spent, you know, I launched the, the Virgin Diet out of the ICU with my son in a coma, and I had to be completely there for him because I'm the sole financial support for my family. But I had, a, I had everything invested in that book, and that book now had to be bigger than I had initially. I wanted it to be big, but now I had to have it be big for another reason. Right. And if my health hadn't been there, that's what I tell people. They go, you must be superhuman. I go, no, I was just super healthy. I, I, I live 95%. I, you know, I, there's always, but I don't cheat on gluten or dairy or sugar. I just don't. Um, but I was 100%. I got my sleep in. I did stress management stuff. I exercised by running the stairs at the hospital. I had Whole Foods delivering to the hospital. I did everything all in. And so I look at this, and the thing is, you don't know when something like that's going to hit, or right. someone gives you the opportunity of your life, and you aren't there physically, emotionally. You don't have to focus the energy, take advantage of it. In two weeks, you could be there. In two weeks, you could be there. Yeah. That's it. You just take the two weeks. Stop letting things hold you back. That as simple as changing what's at the end of your fork. What What have you learned out of all the years you've been doing this about where someone just, you know, if someone's watching this, listening to this, certainly there is the possibility that they're interested in. It doesn't always mean they're going to read the book or take a, a certain action or change, but. Uh, my belief is someone wouldn't even be paying attention if they didn't want it. I mean, it, it, there's something, uh, you know, they're trying to get better, they're already in great shape, they're looking at, at someone like you as a way to just continually fine tune and continue to give them the edge. And then there's other people, they just feel completely lost, screwed, hopeless, uh, they, they have no motivation, they're, they're incredibly sick, um, and, and they just, they're lost, they don't know what to do. What have you, what have you learned how to just really help someone become willing if that's even uh, you know I mean I've, I have a hard time thinking you, you know you can't motivate unmotivated people but you know I mean if you paint a picture sometimes you can yeah um, I don't think that it's that they're unmotivated I think that they've given up hope yeah. I think the biggest the biggest thing that makes me sad out there and I saw you know again I've got a son with a brain injury who's amazing and so many people have written to me saying thank you for giving us hope yeah. showing us what's possible I think you get what you expect and that people start to give up because they've tried, and this is what drives me crazy, they tried the, these green smoothie cleanses that are loaded or these crazy cleanses loaded with fruit. I want to ask right? you about cleanses. We're going to make a note. So, We're going to talk about that in a minute. You know, they've tried these things. They haven't worked, and they figure this is just, oh, I'm getting older. Or it's just as good as I get. And so I feel like they lost their motivation because they lost their hope. And the person that I love to work with the most is the person like a Jeff Moore. Jeff Moore had lost his hope. He'd given up, yeah. right? Yeah. But then he's had a glimpse. He had a, a glimpse into what was possible. He realized everything he'd heard before was wrong, mm -hmm. that he'd been following the wrong set of rules. And he grabbed a hold of it like a lifeline. And that's what I say is just, you know, just grab a hold of this and just give it two weeks. It will totally change your life. And you'll be in a totally different place. Just go for that. Go for that. Get your belief back. This is one of those things people are like, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll 
believe it when I see it. Now you've got to, y you'll see it when you believe it. You have to start with that belief first and just go for it. If you live like a healthy lean person, you will become one. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. I mean, follow them around. They're not drinking diet sodas and eating diet food. They're not having skinny lattes and muffins. They aren't, you know? I, I, had a, I have a big <laughs> friend, I won't mention his name. He watches my interviews, uh, uh, this is a long time ago. Uh, he, um, his first name is Doyle. And he, he said uh, he was drinking a diet Well, that's not soda. a very common name, so no, you just well, kind of called him out there, people, Doyle. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> Doyle, if you're watching, um, he, he's, he ordered a Diet Coke, and he, he said to me, he goes, you know what's funny? He goes, you never see skinny people order diet no. sodas. He's like, you just don't. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and, and, so diet sodas versus, you know, I mean, talk about. Artificial, artificial sweeteners? sweeteners? Yeah. The worst science experiment that we've done, there are two really bad science experiments we've done over the last couple decades. One was um, taking the fat out of food. Mm -hmm. That didn't work. I mean, like, and people still are scared of fat. One of the most important things you can do in your diet is to make an oil change and eat good, healthy fat. Say a load of fat. And number two are these artificial sweeteners. What a dumb thing this is. First of all, they're 300 times sweeter than regular sweeter, sweeteners. So all they do is dull your taste buds so you want more sweet mm -hmm. food, more sweet food, more sweet food. They cause calorie dysregulation because now you've eaten the sweet food, your body expects calories but none come, which causes you to overeat. They've proven that in rat studies. And the whole thing that we thought, oh, well, well you won't gain weight, but they raise insulin. So if they raise insulin, that puts you in fat storing mode. So that creates a problem. And then there's one other issue with them, and I think this is the, the most exciting area of health coming up is the whole microbiome, the bacteria in your gut. Right. They feed the bad bacteria in your gut. If you have, if you have too much bad bacteria in your gut, because you're always going to have some, there's good guys, bad guys, but right. too much of the bad guys, those bad guys actually extract the calories from the food you eat and they store it as fat. So I had one client, I had Leslie um, Hamill, who's Suzanne Summer's st stepdaughter, and she lets me tell the story. She came to me, she was 40 pounds overweight, could not lose weight, exercising, you know, cutting her calories. She had this SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, yeah. too much of the bad guys, mm -hmm. and all we did was kill those suckers off, boom, non-issue. Plus she had a couple food intolerances too. She had a, eggs and dairy. But people don't look at that, and you could be doing everything right, but you're eating these artificial sweeteners, you're feeding the bad bacteria in your gut, and your insulin's up, and you will be storing fat. It is not a calories thing. Calories count, but they're not the absolute. Where they come from counts way more, right? Yeah. So let's talk about juice cleanses, because I remember <sighs> calling you up and I said, I have a friend who's going on a three-day <laughs> juice cleanse and is picking up juice and cayenne pepper and lemon and all this stuff. and." Uh, you, then you went, went on, on this a whole rant, rant I went about on a it, rant. and I was just like, wow, I never even knew that. So for all the people that think they're doing a detox, or they're doing okay. a cleanse. We need to detox every single day, because every day we're getting hit by toxins. So I like the idea of a detox, because to me it means a focused time we're going to do good health habits. But let's just blow one thing right out of the, the walls right now, and that is that if you take the protein out of your diet, to, to like give your body a rest or some really s ridiculous thing. You need the amino acids to transport the toxins out of your body. The amino acids get together with the toxins and shuttle them out. No amino acids, you free up the toxins and you feel worse. So one of the funny things about a juice cleanse is people go, I feel bad, it must be working. I'm like, no dummy, you just toxified yourself, you know? Yeah. You just freed up those toxins because you've cut your calories way down, you're freeing up fat. Toxins get stored in our fat. It's one of the areas of weight loss resistance is if you're more talk if you're if you're um, if you have a lot of toxins coming in, your body will store the extra if they can't get rid of it in your fat cells and then your mm -hmm. body cools down and holds on to the fat. So if you're starting to lose fat, you're releasing toxins, you need protein to pull them out. The other issue with a juice cleanse is a lot of these juice cleanses aren't just straight green drinks, which even if you're drinking just a straight green drink with nothing else, you're going to raise blood sugar. But most of the green drinks, just like the one we just saw, are not really green at all. They use a little green to give it the color. Mm -hmm. But like there's one popular cleanse out there right now that's five pieces of fruit a day in the smoothie with like two cups of spinach. I go, so it's like 50 calories of spinach and 600 calories of fruit each day. Mm -hmm. And I had one poor guy, and, but you can have as much of that as you want. So you can do double, you can snack on some fruit. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Crazy, especially with the apples. So the big issues with those cleanses is they're pulling the protein out, which means you can't then shuttle out the toxins. 
And no, you're not getting enough amino acids in the juice. And then most of the juices are loaded with sugar. Like look at that one that, you know, the maple juice and cayenne pepper and there's a maple. It's either maple juice, maple or syrup or it's molasses. Either one it's sugar right. and lemon juice and somehow that's okay. I'm like, no it's not. Yep. Yeah, so they're just ridiculous. And I think the reason people like them so much is they feel crappy and they think somehow that feeling crappy is good for them. Yeah. It's, you know, your body has no way to tell you. It can't yell at you and say, hey, dummy, you know, this isn't working. So it just does things like lowers your energy or makes you crave things or makes you hurt or gives you a headache. And that it's trying to tell you, stop it. Right? Totally. Well, I think people really learn to tolerate feeling miserable. Yeah. You know, when you, because there's been many times in my life. I mean, when I grew up, uh, my typical diet, because again, I mentioned, uh, you know, my father, a single father, uh, cooked every once in a while, but he was trying to just run a business and raise a couple of kids and, you know, very struggled. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money, so you make McDonald's, Arby's, Taco Bell, Chef Boy RD, I mean, just a lot of crap. I mean, I, I, and I was sick a lot, you know, and, and there was all these ingrained habits, and it wasn't until you know, I became an adult and then I realized, well, yeah, I started reading, you know, I, I never played sports in school because I had a kind of a sadistic little league coach that ruined my liking of sports. And mm. so I, I was never around health habits uh, and it took a tremendous amount of learning and education to unlearn all of these instilled habits. So, so talking about, I want to kind of go back to, to, to kids. Uh, what do you recommend parents do to set them on the right path because there might be some that feel really guilted right now based on what you said and they're like, oh, I didn't realize this. But if you know this now and you don't do it for yourself and you're an adult, that's one thing. But if you know this and you're doing it to your kids, that's just, I mean, you're not setting them up for success. Right. Once you know better, you can do better. But the issue is if you think, I had one client who was a smoker and I said, do you want your kids to smoke? And she goes, oh, no, no, no. They're not going to smoke. I go, they're absolutely going to smoke. They'll, be, they'll go one way or the other, yeah. right? Go, but, you know, if you want your kids to eat better, eat better. Right. Right? I mean, that's the very first thing. Walk your talk. You know, you be the change you want to see in the world. So that's... Well, I, I was, you know, I did uh, the, the, a couple weeks ago, I was interviewing Ariana Huffington about all the stuff I've helped her with with her book. And... Uh, I quoted Dan Quayle, and she, because I heard this quote from Dan Quayle, she's like, I haven't heard, you know, anyone quote Dan Quayle in years, <laughs> and he was being interviewed about um, television, uh, you know, sex and violence on, on television, and, and the person interviewing him saying, well, you know, th that doesn't cause people to go out and, and do things, and he said, well, you know, if, if television uh, didn't influence people, there'd be no such thing as advertising. And I just thought it was a really interesting statement because y your lifestyle is your advertisement for mm -hmm. your kids. I mean, yeah. it, is, it is what is the message that's, that's conveyed. I mean, I, and, I, and I, on this video with Ariana, I said, you know, there's a story I heard about a father who went to see a movie with his two children and one was the, the child, whatever the limit is, 12 or 13 years old, uh, and the other one was, you know, like um, 13, the other one was like 10. And so the father uh, said, I'd like, you know, three tickets, two adults, and one child. And the person selling tickets said, well, sir, you know, I never would have known that your, your other son was, you know, not of age. You could have got two, uh, you know, two child tickets and saved money. And he said, well, you wouldn't have known, but they would have known. And, you know, I always love that because it's like, what sort of message are you conveying? Right. And, you know, my father smoked. My father died of lung cancer because of, and it, but I say he really died of addiction because he was addicted to, and so the, the thing, so what advice is the very best you could give to parents on how to shift that and what they need to do, other than, of course, read the book and learn how to do yeah. this, but. But, I, but, you know, as a mom, I, I used to give this advice before being a mom, and now I go, you know, really, you have to be a mom to understand this because kids are their own people, right? Mm -hmm. The good news is start as early as you can because exposure equals preference. Don't ever make the, the dining table a war zone. That's just a ridiculous thing to do. But the more you can involve your kids. My son, this is a really funny one, my 17-year-old, I had a friend that said, oh, you should check his computer. I bet he's watching porn. I go, my baby angel is not watching porn. <laughs> so I go sneaking in there, and I trust my kids, so I never check anything. But I, I'm like, just to prove a point, I go check his computer. 
My kid is not watching porn. My kid is watching cooking videos. Interesting. Food porn. He's food porn. Yeah, because yeah. he was. He was watching like how to make mashed potatoes. So I was like, dude, wow. we have to talk, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the more you can involve them and make this not a mystery, they'll eat what they prepare because it's fun. Right, so that's a big thing. Also, you put all this stuff, like we have, we have fruit, we have vegetables, we have hummus, we have nuts. We don't keep crap in the house. We never had juice in the house. Mm -hmm. We have sparkling water that we've always had. We have green tea. So that's the stuff they know. Now, it doesn't mean they can never have the other stuff, but they learn that you go out to eat. If you want to have a dessert there, you can have a dessert, but we're not keeping that stuff around. It's not a daily thing. I was raised, I started the day with Pop-Tarts or Captain Crunch, yep. and we had dessert every night after dinner and that was what you did. My mom had a wicked sweet tooth and all of a sudden at 12 I, I realized this was not working for me at all and I started on my path. But you know for my kids this is just their normal but I also am like well you know it's not about being a hundred percent. Be ninety percent. So if you go out you know if you want to have a dessert go ahead. So they learn the proper place for these things. They don't become crazy because I I remember growing up, I had a girlfriend and she was not allowed to have any of these things in her house. So she'd come over to my house and lose her mind. <laughs> you know, right. she'd be like, my mom's like, what happened to the cake? Right. It's like Evelyn Blyer was here, right? So it's, it's really teaching them to eat the good stuff first because kids get full. Adults don't really get full, mm -hmm. right? But kids get full. And just like I told you with Bryce trying the Oreos and going, oh my gosh, you know, I can only eat two. Same thing happened with Halloween candy one year. I'm like, go ahead, eat whatever you want. And literally five pieces throwing up. Right. And right. then we just got rid of it. So. Well, see, that's one thing, too. Once you get your body ad ad adapted to, to clean eating, when you start introducing crappy stuff, your body pretty much it tells you. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of cool. The big thing with, with kids is you focus on um, activity and energy and fitness and doing fun stuff and sports. Like there's so many girls with tweaked body images because of the ridiculous things we see in magazines of, mm -hmm. you know, like a model that literally I remember standing next to one of these models. I'm like, you've, you weigh like 50 pounds less than me, you know, right. you're my height. How does this right. work? I could like knock over with my pinky, boof, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it's important to really focus on activity and sports and all that. And then they get a different idea of food as being fuel and they want to have the energy. And my one son's a tricker, so he's really careful about stuff because he wants to be able to throw his flips, right? right? So in all this period of time, uh, what has the diet I don't know, the, um, what has really changed in terms of we have so much more understanding about who, how food affects us, but from what you were teaching in the beginning, what you knew in the beginning versus recent days, like what, mm -hmm. what have you, what have been the big discoveries that we used to think were right that aren't, or has, how much has it really changed in terms of how one should eat? <clears throat> what I do has changed a lot. What the industry does has not changed much, right? Because what now, what are we on keto, we're on paleo, we're on, it just keeps on rolling over to another, you know, oddity, right? And I think sometimes the mere oddity of these programs is what attracts people to them to begin with. Yeah, I'm absolutely. still there after 40 years. I've seen the Scarlet's diet come and go. I mean, this is way before your time, the cabbage soup diet, we're still there. <laughs> but what I would say we've changed and what's starting to emerge now is the concept of eating management versus diet. And I think you're starting to hear that message a little bit out there. And I really do love that because I know I'm sort of the forefather of eating management versus the, you know, the guy behind the diets. Can I also ask you, because like instead of just eating really nutrition, because there is so much, there's so many people that gobble supplements and there's so much a push for supplements like Gita, my uh, partner, she, uh, you know, says even in the medical world or even in the, you know, in the world of all kinds of different medicines, uh, a lot of it's just a pill for an ill. If you're not given a, if you're not given a medicine, you're going to be given a supplement. So in the world of Con consumption, uh, it's not just the food, it's the liquid, it's the, it's, the, it's the pills. What are your thoughts? I mean, a lot of people think you can't live a health, they've been programmed to believe the food is so deprived, the soil is different than it was 100 mm -hmm. years ago, there's pesticides, there's GMO, I mean, all the different things. And so therefore you can't consume food and get the nutrition you need, so you must consume pills. What, what, what is your take on all of that? Well, first of all, I think of food as medicine. You know, it cures diabetes, it cures high blood pressure, it cures all kinds of things. 
But what has to happen is the right information has to be given to the person, right? Because if you're operating from a position of the wrong information, you're never going to be changing. Now, I do believe in, we're clinical nutritionists, so I believe in blood workup. We look at a lot of different factors. If you came in to see me and you didn't lose weight, I'm turning to your blood workup because weight loss is always a product of four things. It's either your food, it's your exercise, it's a hormone, or it's a drug. It's, there are no others that I know of. Supplements are sort of, in my world, kind of down on the bottom of the pyramid, not way up at the top is the most important thing, because I'm going to look at if you don't eat any dairy, are your calcium requirements being met, magnesium and stuff like that. But let me show you how hard it is for people to really change. Let's take a look at this. How many of you would look at a food like this and go into your grocery store and buy lean ground turkey, 7% fat, 93% fat free, and believe you're eating a low fat food? Raise your hand. Is that a high fat food or a low fat food? It's a low fat food. Okay. All right. When you see the 7%, okay, I'm going to teach you. You might want to write this down, by the way. Just write down grams of fat times nine divided by the calories. Because without that formula, you will never know what you're getting. So let's look at this food. Okay, you can see that eight times nine is 72. 72 out of 160 makes that food 44, 45% fat. That, that food has the exact same fat content as T-bone steak. In other words, I couldn't get you any better results dieting on T-bone steak than I could on that food because in regards to the percentage of fat and how your body would handle it, they're equivalent, right? Can you repeat the formula? Grams of fat times nine divided by the calories equals the percentage of fat. And what I want my clients to do is make sure they keep their fat around 20% or so, mainly getting them from good fats. Now, notice they're not telling you what they ground up. You'll never know, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. Now, watch this one. Okay, so we see that's 45% fat. Notice suddenly they're more than happy to tell you this is the ground breast. They didn't want to tell you what the other one is. This is the one you want to look for. Mm. But let me ask you something. One and a half times nine is 13. 13 out of 120 is like 10%, 11% fat, right? That's a good food because it's under 20. Uh, it doesn't matter if you eat a high fat food here or there. But what is happening if you're eating the wrong one all the time? Now, notice that the first one said it was 7% fat when it was actually 45. And this one's saying it's 1% fat when it's really 13. Does that seem strange to any of you? Yeah. Okay. Take a look at this, though. Okay. Okay, so we see one is 7%, one is 1, when they're really not. Okay. Now, notice this one. 17 times 9 is a little around 150 out of 250 makes that ground turkey 60% fat. That ground turkey burger is as high in fat as bacon, mm -hmm. right? If I wouldn't eat bacon to get lean, why would I eat that expecting a different outcome? Now, it's not about the fat, but it's about your ability to identify what's truly healthy and good for you, right? Now, watch this. Let me explain what the percentage of fat means, because we would all think that 7% means it's 7% fat. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. By law, that term means that the foods displaying its fat by weight, not its fat by calories. And those are completely different things. Yeah. Okay, so watch this and then we'll move on. But okay. So percent fat by weight. See up there in the serving size is 112 grams. 112 grams times 7% is 7.69. Rounded up to the nearest hundredths, it's eight. Is all that 7% is telling you is that there's eight grams of fat in a serving. How crazy is that? You know, we don't discuss food by weight, we discuss it by calories. So if you came in and said, hey Keith, I ate four pounds of protein, three pounds of carbs, and two pounds of fat, I'd have no idea what you're saying to me. <laughs> If we don't discuss food by weight, why are we displaying its fat by weight, right? So there's tons of this stuff going on in front of you, but how can you move forward if you don't know what you don't know? You know, just for distinction too, uh, what is your current, how do you eat? Um, well, what is your diet? And, and maybe explain why if there okay. is a, because there are people in the room like Gita, for instance, is vegetarian. So mm -hmm. okay. I would love to try to get her to eat a big, but she won't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I retired from bodybuilding in 1990. I won every title I ever entered. I never lost a show. And back then, it was solely about the look and the titles, right? As I've gotten older, my sole goal now is not about that. And I, I do care about how I look, but what has happened now is I'm more concerned with longevity and quality of life. You see, nobody in my family made it past 50. You know, I'm in my 60s. I'm the first. 
And so already I've proven that by changing the food, I can change the history, the outcome, right? So today it's more, I'm, a, I'm a kind of more of a plant-based eater. I mainly eat pescatarian. Uh, egg whites and fish is my dominant sources of protein. Occasionally I slip in some chicken. So I moved to more of a plant-based diet because my goals have changed. I want to see how many more quality of years I can get out of my life. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, no, no. That's exactly what I want. Because there's a lot of vegetarians and vegans that eat terrible sure. carbs. They eat shit food. I mean, there's really vegans that are massively overweight, but it's no surprise. Because when you go in the supermarket, is all you got to do is look in people's cart and look at them and go eat that way, look that way. You know, you can see it right in front of you. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what you're uh, known for is your groundbreaking work, mm -hmm. which you refer to as nutrition um, uh, part nutrient partitioning nutrient partitioning yeah um, mm -hmm. can you explain what the hell that is and how to pronounce it again <laughs> right. uh, okay so when I was in the diabetic ward I w what we understood was that a diabetic could eat only so many calories grams of fat and protein at one time and when you gave them smaller more frequent meals many instances you reverse type 2 diabetes All right so my philosophy started to evolve that's this your body can only utilize so many calories, grams of fat, carbs, and protein at one time. We all know that if you overeat at that one time, you gain weight. So let's say the average woman can assimilate around 300 calories. Now, if you cook that food, it's a lot of food. That's a four to five ounce grilled chicken breast smothered in pico de gallo with a six ounce baked potato with fat-free Greek yogurt and chives and a cup of grilled asparagus. And all that food is just right at 300 calories. Now, if you ate that meal, none of it would feed a fat cell. There's nothing in that, what I mentioned, that could feed a fat cell if you were within that parameter. The idea that all weight loss is predicated on a caloric reduction does not work. Because what I'm saying is this. If someone said, Byron, you're supposed to eat 1,800 calories a day. And I know his body could probably assimilate about 500 one time. Now, if he ate two meals a day, he's eating 900 calories at each meal, he hit his caloric requirement for the day, I'm telling you he's going to get fat, and he won't be able to retain his muscle. Now, that's 1,800 calories a day. But if I put him on five feedings at 500 with that kind of parameter, uh, five times five is 2,500, I have increased his calories, his vitality, his energy, and his muscle, and he's losing weight and he's never hungry. So if caloric reduction was the premise on all weight loss, that shouldn't work, but it does. So my clients actually end up eating more food to give them control over food. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. So uh, l let me ask you about all of the different, I mean, there's so much intermittent fasting and there's so, uh, I mean, just fasting in general. And a lot, of, um, a lot of people that I know that never would have done this in the last year or so are trying it. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your take on well, even the originator of that program admits it's not good for women, right? Because that can really mess up your hormones. I think each person has to find their own individual style of how they feel they should eat that's right for them that also creates the result they want, right? And so at the end of the day, I really don't believe in eating less meals as I just explained. I believe in the concept of eating more quality, wholesome foods to generate better health and longevity. I don't want to slow down your metabolism. The biggest people I meet in my clinic are two meal a day eaters, right? Yeah. Uh, one meal a day eaters. So I understand the, 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 the fun of the latest current craze, but listen, I've seen them all come and go. And I'd say in another couple of years, it'll be gone. But remember, when you affect blood sugar by going too long without food, it really interferes with female hormones a lot. So I'm not a big proponent of it. Uh, and w let me ask you also about like, um, uh, just so much emphasis, there's so many documentaries out uh, about food mm -hmm. and about the, uh, you know, uh, farming industry and about the treatment of animals and about you know pesticides and GMOs and organic and what's the difference between an organic you know right chicken and versus a non I mean how how much do you, does that play into your eating and, and your selection of food well first of all all of our cancer patients we work with a lot of cancer patients we immediately do go organic because we can't be certain whether their cancer is being contributed by factors in their diet like pesticides or whatever but again, I let people make their own decision on that. Um, I have a natural tendency to go more towards natural whole foods. Mm -hmm. I want my clients to do that too, but you can't get everybody to do what you want them to do. So what I'm really a big proponent of is what I call better bad choices, yeah. right? And so Eunice said when I call, oh my God, I remember you from all those years of better bad choices. Mm -hmm. Just small changes can yield huge results. So let me just show you one. A can of Coke has, let's say, 40 grams of sugar, okay? Raise your hand if you know how many teaspoons of sugar exactly that is. Eleven, right? 
okay? You write this down. Grams of sugar divided by four equals packets or teaspoons. So 40 divided by four means there's 10 packets of sugar in a can of Coke. If you drink two cans of Coke a day, you're drinking 20 packets of sugar. So I put 20 packets of sugar in here, and that's how much sugar is in two cans of Coke. Now, if this person just found a small, different beverage to drink, over the course of time, this small change would he yield huge results. Because if they just drank two cans of Coke a day, at the end of the week, they drank 140 packets of sugar. Oops, excuse me. And that's how many, oops, that's, don't worry about it, we'll get it at the end. That's how many packets of sugar they're drinking every week just from two cans of Coke a day. See, and so the premise is not to get people to give up everything, it's to show them, because once you show somebody the real truth, it's hard, once you know it, it's hard to kind of go back there. Yeah, Right. okay. So let me ask you about um, the second thing that you're most known for, which is uh, relapse prevention. So it's your psychology in that area. Why mm -hmm. is that so important? Because as you all know, because it's the same, right? If you don't change the way you think, you cannot change what you do. And we're all aware of that, right? Let me share with you some of the common little statements we all make to ourselves that sound productive and look at what I'm gonna do. Raise your hand if you've ever said, I'm gonna start my diet on Monday, <laughs> right? Okay. I would change that thought to be more accurate of what you're really gonna do. Instead of saying, I'm gonna start my diet on Monday, what I think you should really say is this. I'm gonna see how fat I can get before Monday. <laughs> because the thought occurs to me, I have to stop eating bad by Monday, so I better eat as much food as I get my hands on by Monday, right? Another one is, I know what to do, I just don't do it, right? So that sounds right, right? That's rooted in the pain-pleasure principle of Psychology 101, which we're all very familiar with here, right? The idea is this. If you're saying, I know what to do, I just don't do it, what you're really saying is this. Although I'm uncomfortable the way I look and feel right now, what you're asking me to do is more uncomfortable because their association with changing their food has always been rooted in the negative. And that's what I change is it shouldn't be negative. It should be a joy to make this change and you should love your food. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so in terms of um, the better bad choices, most people here travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so they're in airports a lot. Yep. And what I have learned to the best of my abilities is I always package food with me and carry it with me. Yep. And, and I fly first class a lot and they'll even serve stuff in first class, but most of the time it's crap and right. it's, not, it's not good food. And so I have learned to carry a lot of mm -hmm. healthy foods with me. Most people do not. And there are certain situations and it's easier when I'm leaving my home yeah. because I have the food with me versus if I happen to be somewhere and getting right. access to good food. So what advice would you give in terms, because sometimes you're in an airport, you have no food. Right. Do you fast? Do you, what's a better bad choice than that sort of thing when you have such a, a, a selection of a bunch of right. mostly crappy food? See, that's a great question. So what we really work on from a psychological viewpoint is coping skills, right? And if you master your coping skill, you can master whatever it is you're working on, right? So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna teach our clients literally how to go into any restaurant and order cleaner food when they want to. And it's gonna be better. And so remember, a small change can yield big results if you started ordering better. Secondly, we're gonna give you coping skills to let you know today we live in a society of ease. It's easier today than ever. There's a company called iconmeals.com. You can literally call them up and say what you wanna order. They'll cook all the food for you and it'll show up at your hotel on the day you arrive. So if you stay in an embassy suites or place where they have a refrigerator and microwave, they cook the food, they weigh the food, they measure the food, and it shows up on the uh, uh, hotel doorstep, and they're very good at that. So there's companies like that that exist that we give access to our clients to let them know that it, isn't, it doesn't have to be impossible. But the real one is, how do you walk in any restaurant, navigate it, and order well? Let me just give you an example of what I would ever order in a Mexican restaurant. How many chips do you think it would take to get to 300 calories? <laughs> 14, not very many. Swipe it in guacamole, it's even radically higher in calories, right? Look, I sit down at a Mexican restaurant, they wanna bring the chips, I just, I, I never say I can't have that, I simply say I just don't eat that anymore. And how my brain handles and processes that is quite a bit different. Secondly, I never order off the menu, I just set it aside. I say, do you have shrimp today? They say, yeah. Can you just grill it without butter and oil but season it? Sure, I wait till they write it down. Just bring me a basket of corn tortillas with pico sauce and shredded lettuce and I make my own shrimp tacos. That or their white fish are the only two things I'd ever order in a Mexican restaurant. It's easy, right? But I love that food. 
You know, it's flavorful, it's seasoned, it's not all dry. I can put pico, I can put salsa on, I can put tomatilla on it, right? Mm. So ordering mm. is easy in the restaurant if you have the skills. Hey there, this, this is uh, Joe Polish, the tall one in this, in this video. And I've got uh, the very awesome Dr. Mark Hyman and JJ Virgin, and we're working out here together. And Mark feels great. Yes, he does. Look yeah. at that. Yeah. Look, let's go. Let's, let's do it. Mm. <laughs> so he probably won't be able to lift his arms up later. Uh, well, here's, here's the thing. Both of you are like uh, sugar experts. So which one is he smart? I love sugar. You do love sugar? I love sugar. All right, but you both have written books about why <laughs> sugar is toxic and poisonous. Now, I guess what we're, Well, we're, this is all about blood sugar balance. Right? And what's which your, is what's critical, your which is solid. every, which is everything. I'm just right? fed up. I'm fed up. Yeah. <laughs> fed up with sugar, fed up with the food industry, fed up with all the bullshit we're eating, all the crap we're true. eating. It's, it's so is JJ. All the lies the government's yes. telling us. All the stuff that's food. I mean, I, I actually met with a woman who's head of the ADA, American Diabetic Association this week, who has diabetes, who was following their freaking guidelines, was on four medications, shots, and all kinds of crap, and wasn't getting better. Yeah, she went on my worse, program, right? and boom, off the medications, diabetes better. And she's like, wait a minute, the ADA is wrong. If you follow that diet, you will become diabetic. Yes, absolutely. It's okay, so when you say programs, so you both have programs, what do people do? People watching this, what do they do to get an optimal physical shape, get diseases? They buy her book, they buy my book, yeah. they do them both, and we, they get a double whammy. We are everybody that... How do people get both of you in their house? Like, does this have a sleepover? <laughs> like, what, if they wanted a sleepover, how would they do it? You don't want an eatover, not a sleepover. <laughs> Well, that, that too. A I mean, workout. A workout. That would be actually kind of cool. What if there was a prize where you could hang out with Mark and JJ, get back massages, the whole work? You know, I'm good. Who's doing the back massage? Me, I'm good. Yeah, that's yeah. how I got into medicine. It's just massage people. are like, oh, I feel good. I'm like, oh, I like people. Yeah, let's maybe do some medicine here. Well, he's been okay. going into houses and cooking. That's true. I well, okay, so I'm going I'm to plug some stuff here because I have done amazing interviews with both of them, which you can find at GeniusNetwork.com. I love marketing.com. We put them all kinds of. And I love Joe.com. And yeah, and I love Joe. And that's really this because this video I really wanted to leave back to me. This <laughs> always, no. always. But Joe's okay, always. so so out of the out of all of the things that you guys have learned, what would you consider are the essential <laughs> elements in taking people that are at a stuck point? They're not yeah. exercising. They're not eating right. They feel hopeless. They have consumed, bought so many books, yeah, and they, yeah. they feel lost. I what think, do I they mean, do? My view, and I, I think JJ is probably similar, is people need to do a reset, like a reboot. When your computer's <laughs> on the fritz and it's going round and round and it doesn't work, you've got to do a reset. So that's why I wrote the 10-day detox. So people can do anything for 10 days, mm -hmm. and in 10 days, if you change your food and do a few simple lifestyle practices, you literally can change your physiology, retake your brain chemistry back, retake your hormones, retake your taste buds, and in 10 days you can go from feeling like crap to feeling great, and the weight loss is just a side effect. Yes, it's, it's automatic, like it's you automatic, said. And right. here's the coolest part about that, because people talk about losing weight and they're white knuckling and struggling. Oh, forget it. But when you reset your taste buds and you get rid of your sweet tooth, which you can do in seven to 14 days. We've Absolutely. seen it. All of a sudden you've got the control back over sugar. And even though, like Martin says, I love sugar, it's like it's not an issue because you don't crave it anymore. Right. And then everything changes. It's really true. I think I think most people don't get that it's not their fault. Like people, I think they blame themselves. Well, they're being duped I met by a woman, right, I met, I met a woman the other day who was told by a food expert, a nutritionist, that she it was there was no such thing as food addiction. That it was her fault. That she didn't have willpower. Oh, and that she couldn't control God. herself. So there she no such thing so she power. read uh, my book, which talks about the power of these foods like sugar to hijack your brain, literally to be biologically addictive. She says, I'm gonna try it. And she literally got her body back, lost 30 pounds, and was able to reset her brain and realized that it wasn't her fault that she was fat. It wasn't her fault she was craving. It wasn't that she yeah. didn't have willpower. And our whole government policy and the food industry is all about blaming the fat person. Eat less, exercise more, moderation, all things. There's no moderation in bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if you actually are eating trans fats and high fructose corn syrup, you can't moderate that. You've just gotta cut it out. And if you do that, You'll reset, and then you can enjoy all sorts of foods, but you're not going to become a victim of your brain chemistry that's been hijacked by the food industry. Yeah, and if you yeah. assume that these are all drugs, which they are, and sugar mm. is the number one drug of choice, it's taking down everyone everywhere. Kids are not smoking and drinking at age five. Mm -hmm. They're having juice and cookies. If you knew mm -hmm. that, you wouldn't have a little bit. No, that's that right. would be ridiculous. But, so I, but I, I, do eat sugar. I do eat sugar, but like it's, it's a recreational choose. drug. Like I like it's tequila, choose. but I don't like choose. drink it all day long. But people right. have sugar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, they start with cereal and milk that's and right. juice and a banana or a muffin and right. a latte. I mean, that's right. And people don't realize that breakfast cereal is 75% sugar. It shouldn't be called right. breakfast. It should be called dessert, right? <laughs> it's like...
So we need to just reset and understand how to and how find where everything is sneaking in, so that we don't turn our salad into a Sunday and our. I love that salad into a Sunday, right? All right, so JJ, exercise. How frequently do you must you do it? Kind of, sort of. What are your thoughts on this? You one? must. Do she it. told me 15 minutes twice a week. I'm good with that. So, <laughs> yeah, for weight training, look resistance. Look at this. Look at this specimen. This is like 15 minutes once a year. Look at this. <laughs> well, this was the start to a whole new mark. Right? Yes. Right? Today is the last day of the way Mark used to be. I oh, know. Right. You got to move more. Everyone should be moving at least 60 minutes a day. But if you're not getting hot, sweaty, and it hurts a bit, it doesn't count as exercise. But we are supposed to move. That's yeah. why you were hurting me this morning. But that's why, because I wanted it to count as exercise. Oh my God. And I, I, liked I was it. hurting. I liked trust it me. a little bit. <laughs> JJ and, then, and then, high intensity interval training or cardio burst training three times a week to accumulate four total minutes of all out bursting. So if you're on the bike, What's bursting where you go as fast you as you can? You go as hard as you can for 30 to 60 seconds and you don't want to pace yourself, you want to burn yourself out. Yeah. It'll be the longest 30 to 60 seconds of your life. And then you recover and you do it again. Four to eight total minutes, three days a week. And then mm. resistance training, hitting, pushing, mm. pulling, mm. pulling. Pulling, nobody pulling. told me about pulling. I was no, always you pushing. That one. Hips and thighs and core. You do that at least twice a week. Mm. So for you, we'll start there. Baby steps. I'm good. And, I'm good. and that's the big thing is how do you fit fitness in? And then Pretty you do flexi baby. <laughs> You've been whining. You've been whining here all day. And then flexibility I work, was. but really like <laughs> yoga flexibility work because you want to lower your stress yeah. hormones. And so that's that. That is huge. And that's that's why I don't true. like endurance training. That's true. So that's true. there you go. I mean, that's a simple core core formula that I think we agree on. And you're just we're missing a little piece. I know. But we're fixing that. And that helps you with your sugar cravings. Yes, it does. Yeah. It helps, it just helps you with your life. And so if you do not take time out for this now, you will take time out for it later with very poor health and disease and probably misery and suffering. And so if you're a parent, this is also something that children will watch how you live. They will watch you become a model. And so you want to be a model not only for yourself, but for everyone around you. And that's how everyone around you gets better. And there are a lot of forces that are literally always directing you and wrong. In, in, see, because I have always loved the line that the most expensive information in the world is bad information. And there's a tremendous amount of bad information that can kill you. So both of these individuals have written amazing books and have led literally, collectively, millions of people to better health. So what is the best book for people to start with, with you and then with you? I think it's a 10 day detox diet. 10 yeah. days, people can do anything, reset, and then they own their body. And then they realize how close they are to health and happiness. And it's just a few days, and if it doesn't work for you, great. But if it does, you literally get your life back. It will work if they work it. it, it I, it's true. If you it's true. It. You don't even, but you don't have to believe me. You just have to do it. Yes, and the sugar impact diet, and what the sugar impact diet helps you do is identify where all the sugars are sneaking into your diet and to understand that it's not about no sugar, but that all sugar is not created equal, and you need to know which to choose and which to lose, which is made simple to do. There you go. And, and if you watch this on YouTube or wherever else, I'm going to put the links of their interviews and stuff related to both of them in the in the little area. So just do it and uh, it's, it's fun hanging and out. And you can pay like $5,000 to come see us or you could buy the book for 10 bucks on That's Amazon true. and like change your life. That's true. That's it? And they make good presents. Famous too. last words uh, from you. Uh, <laughs> I think the it. most significant thing you can do to change your health, to change the health of your kids, your grandkids, to change the economy is to lower your sugar impact. Absolutely. I would say remember that sugar is a recreational drug and use it like that. Don't think of it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's a drug. And enjoy it, but not in a way that you would enjoy like tequila all day long. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead. Get over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch them.